This conference will now be recorded. And just so that everyone who is on the call knows, uh, Roland Stafford is a filmmaker who has a feature film that's going to be in Klamath Independent Film Festival this year. He made the film One Dead Dog. He also had a film in last year called Road to Bob, which also played at the Ashen Film Fest, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you being here and uh, sharing a little wisdom with some of our first time film students about the process. Sure, sure happy to help. There's Jimmy like and Nick. I know you're you're also probably bored out of your mind being stuck at home. <laughs> so um, I actually just got out of the car. Um, I just drove up to Bend, Oregon, and just got to my place here. So. Oh, so you're you're at the you're at the cabin where you filmed? Literally at the cabin where one dead dog was filmed. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm gonna watch it here again. <laughs> so we are just missing Joni and Hannah from from joining, and we're not sure if Bonnie's gonna come on or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't think she is. Okay, that's okay as long as you're here, Curtis. We know that Joni and Hannah don't have a film yet, so right. Do we do we want to go ahead and get started, and if they they join yeah, I would say let's go ahead and get started. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us yet again. I know it has been a extremely busy, hectic, and mind melting week with all of the information we've thrown your way. Uh, you're in the stretch run now, so hopefully everyone has been editing and getting a chance to delve into uh, their projects and and whatever software you're using, be it an iMovie or Movie Maker or OpenShot or or uh, DaVinci Resolve. Uh, whatever you're using, hopefully it made sense. Um, no one had any questions for me, so I'm not sure if that was a good sign or a bad sign after our, our editing session yesterday. But uh, hopefully it's been a good learning experience. So today we are going to be talking a little bit about music in film. And uh, we also, okay, so Clem says that he needs some help with uploading. Um, Clem, did you get my email that I sent out in the last like 10 to 15 minutes? Uh, yeah. If Okay, so... Uh, that link will connect it to, um, you should just be able to drag and drop from your computer desktop uh, into that folder to upload it. Are you having issues with rendering your, your video? Because but uh, it, yes. you can't just, you, you, okay, so uh, which software program are you using? I'm using Final Cut. Oh, okay. So if you're you're using Final Cut in the file menu, um, there's a drop down menu uh, that says share. And if you go to um, master file, then it will give you options for how you want to export it. It'll take probably a few minutes for your computer to process it. So, you know, give, give it time. But uh, once you are... Sorry, in, what am I looking for under file? So uh, bear with me. I'm opening up my version of Final Cut right now so we can follow along step by step. Thank you. Uh, but, then, but there is a share option um, and it'll Final Cut will give you all sorts of different options for how to share. But the one that you want says master file. So it's it's a side menu from the main file, file one. So there's an import media one uh, option, then there's an export. And if you go under there, there should be something that says master file default. I forget what the shortcut code key is. That's why I'm Mine is up grayed the out. Cut. Does that mean I've done something awry here? Your, yours is what? It's it's gray, like it's not black for me to be able to click on it. Okay. Uh, you may want to just close out a final cut and reopen it again. It it may be what you have active at the moment. Okay. I have the the project. Should I just go? Should I just go to the project? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll open up the project files so that the everything that you've edited shows up in your in your highway in your primary storyline. Okay. Uh, you don't need to highlight all of it. You don't need to click on anything so that it's yellow. The project just needs to be open. And once it's open under that file menu, you should be able to find master file for the export. And then that, that will process a video file on your computer. Once it's done rendering, 
then you'll have a saved MP4 or M4V, whatever format you're, you're going to use, saved on your computer. And then you can just drag and drop that into the Google Drive. Is that XML? Is that what master file no. is? Or is that... No, the, the XML should come out as an actual video file. So either a .mov or a .mp4 or .m4v, depending on, on which, which um, file type that you want to process. Okay, so what I'm looking at on the screen says import transcode media. Then there's a grayed out thing that says check media for compatibility, relink files, export XML. And then yeah. export captions is grayed out. Share, is that what I want? Master file. Yes, there we yes. Share, share and master file. That, okay. That's where you need to go. Okay, sorry. Hey, we um, literally just finished putting like the little final touches on it to feel like we could send it. That you know, that, two two. <laughs> your projects don't have to be finished right now. What we want to see is just in whatever state they, they are in. The idea today is that we're going to take a look at what you have so far and provide some feedback. And we actually have a, a filmmaker joining us who is going to help with providing some feedback and some suggestions on things that, that, that you can do. Um, Clem, uh, I just saw your project come through. So yours is in. I'm going to download it now. So we have two films in so far that we can take a look at, and we'll wait to see how uh, everyone else's comes in. So um, Andrew wants to talk about uh, film festivals and distribution for a little bit, and uh, Curtis Peoples is joining us from the Klamath Folk Alliance, uh, and he wanted to share some wisdom about how music sets a mood and a tone for your film. Can we have some sample clips uh, to show that uh, Curtis has provided? So, Andrew, do you have a preference on what we start off with? Let's do music first. Okay, great. You would usually get your music in before sending to festivals. So. <laughs> Terrific. Well, uh, one, just as a reminder, I touched on it briefly in yesterday's session, but uh, music is what really sets the emotional tone and, and mood. But you can't just take any piece of music that you want and just throw it in your film because you think that it sounds cool. You know, there's licensing that you have to go through and whatnot. So people have access to stuff through what we're doing. Um, you can get music from audio or motion array through uh, Climate Films accounts. So just if you want a specific piece from there, contact me. But we would love it if the music that you use comes from Climate Folk Alliance. They are sponsors of our film camp this year. And uh, it's some terrific local musicians that have provided a wide assortment of music, among them Curtis, who is joining us on, on this call. Curtis, uh, full disclosure, is also a board member with Climate Film. Uh, so he, he pulls double duty, but uh, he is uh, an accomplished mu musician who has some music that you can use in your films, and he's brought some clips. So Curtis, do you, uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of take over with whatever you want to say is uh, regarding the symbiotic relationship between music and film. Well, for me, music and film kind of came within about the past five years. More, more than anything, I was just playing in bands and playing around local bars, clubs, things like that. And um, as I got more time, I guess I'll back up a little bit. So I work at Texas Tech University and I run a large music archive there that I started 20 years ago. So I collect music from actual musicians and uh, organizations. And then the dean of the libraries came to me one day and says, can you build me a recording studio? And I said, yeah, I can do that. So we built a state-of-the-art recording studio, all digital pro tools, and it's free for all our for our faculty and staff and students to use. And that's kind of how I got into doing music for film as we began to have people come in that were looking to do like some independent type films and documentary type work. And uh, so I just started collaborating with people. One of the first ones that I did was a student uh, there at Texas Tech, and we had been in a songwriting class together. And he had no budget, really, you know, it's just an independent film. He had this idea, it's called Bogart County, and it's all based on this business dealings and drugs and all this stuff. And, it, and it's, it's all kind of a silly film. And, uh, and he came to me wanting music, and of course he had no budget, but I knew him, I said, hey, I'd, I'd like to do this because it gets me doing something new and uh, out, of, out of my wheelhouse. I had been performing a lot with a dance troupe in Lubbock, Texas, where I would provide music and then the dancers would choreograph. And then we actually the music that I have uploaded, a lot of the music to the Google Drive folder came out of a collaboration with them where we 
they choreographed my entire album when we put that on. So that's sort of, I'd been doing some collaboration work, but coming to film was something new. And so when the, the Bogart County film came along, he, he didn't need music throughout the entire thing. So there'll be areas where there's music and then it's just dialogue and uh, th throughout the rest of it. But as you know, music can carry on as sort of an underlying tone or a theme throughout something It doesn't always have to just go completely away. It doesn't have to be full on where you can hear it. But for this Bogart County, we'll start with the intro. It was sort of this, uh, I just got with him and he, I asked him, what do you want for these scenes that you want me to do music for? So communicating with the filmmaker was the most important thing there was to find out what were they wanting. <clears throat> so this opening scene is a sort of drive out into the country. This guy's got a bag over his head. So it sort of did this swampy Southern kind of Dobro slide kind of thing for that. And then it kicks into the intro of the movie where it's a guy walking around town. I just go to more of a kind of mellow acoustic kind of light kind of thing just to kind of set it up. So if we want to roll that first clip, we can sure. do that. So what people need to be paying attention to isn't necessarily the music as far as an individual piece, but how the music sets the emotional tone to match the, the, the uh, what's being presented within, within the film. Because you really want music to accent whatever emotion you're trying to drive. And, and it's about finding that, that mood and that genre to match what, whatever the visual is, right, Curtis? Exactly. And so for this opening clip, the when he goes into the walking around town, I already had that piece of music because I was going to getting had written that to use in a documentary that I was also working on at the same time. But since it was all my music, I just decided, you know, I was letting him use it for free. That was just one less piece that I had to write because I'd already written it for something else. So, uh, but it seemed to work out, I think, you know, for the opening scene. And then, of course, the the first part, I just got some kind of swampy sound and slide part to give it sort of a you know, there's some some tension there you know that something's going wrong there's somebody with a bag on their head so it's kind of kind of the feeling that i was going for okay let's take a look i can't hear the audio oh. i'm i'm hearing it um no, I'm not hearing it. Oh, okay. No. Um, hang on. Technical difficulties. Bear, bear with me. Uh, I just want to hear the audio in this scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the audio would be kind of important when we're talking about music with, with yeah. within a film. Um, you know, and it, I even tested this out yesterday and it was working fine for me. I know that we had issues back on Monday when I tried to show something, but that's why I switched to a different computer because Loopback and Ecamm Live were malfunctioning on my laptop, but they're working great on this computer up until this very second. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, let me see here. Do it right have it working in my preferences. Webcam, recordings, web. I may need to re well. Let me test this again re real quick. Uh, so. E cam microphone is okay. Well, let me try this again, and you tell me if you can't hear anything. No audio. That's so weird. I'm I'm hearing it on my end. Um, maybe I can do a share screen instead. I swear this was working like 
because uh, I tested it last night, knowing that we that we were, we were going to be doing it, and I tested it again like half an hour ago, and then as people join, it 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 doesn't work. Um, let me the pass through. Still no audio. Matt, I'm I'm sorry, Curtis. I'm I'm failing you here. <laughs> if there was a way I could share my screen, I would, but I don't know. Uh, maybe instead of trying it through eCam, if I play it directly off of my desktop and share screen from there. So yeah, that might work. Bear with me here. Let me share screen. I know this is super exciting, but just bear with me. Okay, we're gonna give this one more try. Instead of playing through Ecamm, sure. I know this is probably super exciting for Roland too. Oh, it's saying that I need to. Um, Restart go to meeting for the for the changes to take effect so that that being the host it I'm not sure if it's going to kick everyone out or, or not. So um, the link should work. Well, let's try this, but adva advance warning this might get kicked out and I will send out a super quick uh, invite if that's the case. Okay. I can't hear you now. Everyone's still here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now let me try. Let me make sure that okay, so I got my ecam. We'll do this one one more time to try it. Nope, no audio. Okay, then share screen, apps, quick time player, share, virtual sources, quick time player on, and let's try this. I'm not hearing audio. Damn it. <laughs> I, you know, uh, yesterday, concerned that loop, loop back and go to meeting might have an issue with these videos. I specifically did a test meeting with just myself where I played the videos uh, with the share screen through loop back and Ecamm and recorded it and then watched the videos to make sure that there was audio on and there was audio on. So uh, we may not be able to um, share videos with audio, Curtis. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. What we can do is we can put them in the Google Drive and have people listen to them on their own time beyond the, the meeting so that they can hear some different samples. If you made me a presenter, would I be able to share my screen and see if that works? Let me try that and see. Okay, Curtis, you are now the presenter. See if that helps. Okay. Bear with us, Mary Jane and Nick and Clem, Nolan, sorry. <laughs> Roland, I'm sure this is super exciting for you. <laughs> oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Okay, I don't know if you can see my screen or not. Can you see we that? Are, we are seeing your screen. The question is, are we, okay, are I'm gonna we hit, gonna get audio? Uh, let's see. Do you have audio? I do, but it's really quiet. 
Yeah. Yeah. There, there is some audio, but I think it's just reverberating from your computer into your microphone. So we're kind of picking that up secondhand. Okay. Let me see. It's coming through my headphones. I'm not getting it out of the... The exact same thing was happening with me. <laughs> I was hearing it just fine. No one else was. I wonder what's going on here. I'm at 100%. Well, while we're we're doing this tech issue, maybe Roland, you can talk about how um, with uh, with your films. Hang on. Maybe you you could discuss um, from a filmmaker's per perspective doing feature length films. What you look at as far as music to set the emotional tone for for your films. Sure. Um. I can't stress how important music is when it comes to feature films. Uh, I used to be of the belief that I really didn't need much music, um, that I could just tell a story and the atmosphere, the quiet atmosphere would tell itself. But when I first made One Dead Dog, I think I had about three parts in the movie where there was music, an actual score. And watching it again over an hour and a half, you just need music in certain parts or the scene just dies. You honestly notice the empty space. Um, I think there are certain filmmakers who can use quiet very, very well, but they are very talented filmmakers. Um, one of my heroes, uh, Kelly Reckhart, certainly knows how to use silence very well. Um, certainly if you look at a film like uh, the Coen brothers, No Country for Old Men, is full of stillness, and that's amazing. But as far as a filmmaker like myself, I needed music to tell a story and to set a mood and to move the pacing along. I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think if you ignore it, you have a lot of dead space in certain scenes, and the audience will get very bored. And you just can't have talking all the time. Or, or stillness. Um, so I learned the hard way about it. I didn't think I would need much music for my films, but I was I was absolutely wrong. Yeah. Like, I hope that answers your question uh, somewhat. Yeah. Curtis, uh, do you want to keep trying this, or do you just want to want to talk about music in, in general, and then we can set the clips into a shared drive and email it out to everyone so that they can review it on their own time. I was going to unplug my headphone and see. I didn't know if maybe having this USB jack was affecting the Hello? share of the screen. But yeah, I was going to unplug Hello? this. Hello? Is that is that Joni and, and Hannah? Just it's Joni Bonnie. Me? Oh, Bonnie. Hello, Bonnie. Hey, Bonnie. I, I've been trying for 20 minutes to get, to get on. I finally decided to call. I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's quite quite all right. We're having tech issues of our own on on our side of things, so it just it oh. fits with it fits with the theme of the day, I guess. Uh, ah. So um, okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen and just see if this will even work. Okay. And share. So this is a a fight scene that the guy wanted some '70s kind of music for. It's a short little clip, so let's see if we can even hear it. Okay. So yeah. could you even I mean, hear that? Yeah, it was faint, but I, I could hear it. It's very Isaac Hayes uh nineteen seventies black exploitation film uh vibe to it. That's exactly what he was going for. So <laughs> the next one <clears throat> is a this guy's been at a comedy club and he kind of has this flash 
back or sort of this fantasy that he's going to be this big star. And so he's standing outside and this neon kind of sign, which is actually this pizza place in town. But uh, he was kind of going for like a comedy show kind of thing. So I, I tried to produce sort of a something you might hear in the 70s or 80s, sort of outside of a comic club or kind of, you know, in the Saturday Night Live kind of vein there. So let's see if we can get this up. So could you hear that at all? Yeah, again, it's soft, but uh, yeah. there's enough of it that we, we can hear it. So, uh, so but between the, those, those two clips uh, that you just showed, you're using music to accent the, the, the visual, but it, you wanna make sure that the, the music fits the same mood and, and, and tone. So why are you picking out those kind of selections? And Bonnie, this is something that you could chime in on as well as far as um, your opinion on how music drives the emotional tone of film. Um, yeah, well, music has so many different ways it can affect a film. It can either uh, forecast something that's going to happen or just come in and uh, kind of enhance any emotions that might be going on or um, it just kind of helps shape the the scene with the auditory ways. Um, I don't know, it creates the atmosphere or it, it could forecast the atmosphere or it, it could actually sum it up af afterwards. So it depends how they want that music put into it. So it, it can either subtly accentuate or the music can be the driving force of, of, of the scene. A great example is a film like Jaws. Imagine listening to Jaws or watching Jaws on mute and how boring of a film that would be. Or watching Star yeah. Wars without the John Williams score with that big bombastic cl classical music. What kind of experience? <laughs> it just paints the colors um, uh, auditorily. Um, of the scene, yeah, it connects, tries to connect more with your emotion and in, in that scene. Yeah. And Bonnie, um, you've worked on music for film specifically in the past, right? I, I know that you, you're a musician, but you've also done some film work. Is that right? I, I've done more with background for plays um, than than films. Although I've I've helped out and I've uh, been there to try to help people find something, but I've done more with plays. I I have a degree in music composition and theory, so I write music and uh, used to write a lot more for plays, backgrounds and plays and things going on, setting the scene, the mood. But the, uh, the, the concept is still the same, though, wh whether it's on stage or on screen, of trying to find music that fits the right tonal that's mood and to kind of drive whatever emotion that you're trying to convey. Yes, yes. And uh, it's uh, kind of a psychologically conditioning people to what's going on or enhancing it anyway. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Curtis, do you, do you want to try one more clip or do you have anything that you want to add to that as far as the importance of, of, of combining music with film? I, I think like what Bonnie just said there, you know, and, and what everybody has, it's, you know, it can be foretelling, it can be, you know, playing off of the scene to help bolster that scene, kind of like what I was doing there with the, the 70s Isaac Hayes kind of music, trying to get that vibe. Um, the last clip that I'll show today is one from a documentary that I was got hired to do music for. And it was interesting because I was already writing this instrumental album and I had this song called Cicada 
And I've actually got it up to the Google Drive in my uh, folder there if anybody wants to use any of that music. So it's sort of this big production instrumental piece. And this documentary was about a pastel artist named Frank Ray who would come from Dallas, Texas up to the West Texas area and paint all these pastels. Great work. And come to find out the uh, the truck that he took that he brought all of his students in was called Cicada. So it was just sort of this thing that just kind of worked out and it wound up Cicada being the theme song throughout the entire documentary. So if, if there's an interview going on or something, then you'll hear that song just a little bit below. It's also in, it's in the intro. And then when there's talking going on, a lot of times she will revert back to that song and just kind of have it at a low volume. Also working on this film, I wrote some other things and uh, it, original music. And then she wanted uh, like Home on the Range. So we recorded a, a version of that public domain. Everything we did was either original music or public domain music. So we didn't have to worry about licensing, uh, at least for the music aspect of it. The art's a whole different uh, ball game. Also, Frank Ray, there was an archive. He was also a musician and he, he was he would teach people how to play violin. And in the archive in Canyon, Texas, I went up there and there was a, lots of his personal papers and stuff. And there was actual music and things that he'd written. So I brought those back to the studio and brought in somebody to like play a piano piece of something he had written. And we used, so we used some of his music for that as well. So it was a real interesting project. This uh, will be the opening of it hopefully you can hear it and we were also looking for a narrator for this and i know michael martin murphy so i called him up and this was just like right up his alley you know being a western uh, americana kind of guy so he he's the narrator for this so let me go share my screen for those who don't know that name uh, because we do have y younger folks as a lot of our, our students. Uh, that is a famous musician who had a massive hit song back in the 70s with a song called Wildfire. Yeah. Okay. So this is the opening to Pastel Poet of the Plains, Frank Ray, and this is Cicada. And then it'll have uh, Michael Martin Murphy talking a little bit. Hopefully you can hear What's remarkable about Frank Ray is that very few of us know what's remarkable about him. Monday, May 7th, 1945. The front page of the city edition of the Dallas Morning News reports the passing of an American artist and Texas treasure on Sunday, May 6th. The article describes Mr. Ray as a picturesque fellow with tangled white beard and white hair. All right, I'll go ahead and stop that. Okay. There, so. So the, with that, uh, since the theme of the film has a very old-timey and sort of western-y vibe, uh, again, music selection is really key to set the mood and set the tone. You don't want to throw in Foo Fighters or Lady Gaga type music on top of something where you're trying to convey old western uh, uh, mood settings. So it's important to pick the right genre of music. It's important to pick the right mood that that music uh, creates as that's going to either accentuate your project or it's going to absolutely kill your project if it's the, the wrong kind of music that just clashes with what, whatever the, the visual may be. Yeah, when I started writing that song years ago, it's I had one of these nothing else to do moments. I was sitting there watching TV with my girlfriend and I was like, I was, I was like fed up. I couldn't do, watch any more TV. So I just went and picked up my guitar and thought about one of my favorite piano players. And 15 minutes later, I had the basic idea of the song. And it was sort of set around a summertime kind of feeling up in west, up in northwest Texas there in the panhandles, big yellow rolling grass plains and stuff. And so that's kind of what I had in mind. And it was a summertime song in cicada and, and to emulate those cicada sounds that I brought in some Indian instruments like from India. So we have a, a tambura buzzing in the back and then I've got some other wood percussion to emulate the sounds Sorry. of cicadas out there. So. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun, so it just it just kind of worked out that 
she had this documentary, I had this song all working at the same time. And and then I wound up getting hired to do more music for it. So it it was all music for hire. So I still own the rights to all my music. Okay, great. Uh, any final thoughts, Bonnie, about uh, music and film before we, we move on? Well, um, let's see. You could take uh, any kind of a melody. Uh, what I do is, uh, I don't know if you can hear this on the piano. Is very simple melody. Did, did you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, depending on what the tone is and mood, say it's a um, a girl walking through the woods, um, and she's. Let's see. I got to put the phone down and play with two hands. <laughs> well, the. Uh, I... It's kind of a happy thing. Right. But what if it were if she were lonely? probably do it in a minor key what if it started to get dark and what if it opened up into a meadow with a unicorn say So many chords that you can use with the same melody that that can uh, change, change the mood of, the, of your as your story changes or enhance the emotions. Those are just little ideas. <laughs> yeah. And it it doesn't need to be overly complex too. A very simple melody can actually be a very driving force. I mean, uh, there's films that have been driven by the music, not not just musicals yes. per se. That's the obvious thing. But look at something like uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, when the, the yeah. aliens and humans meet. It's just <laughs> bum 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 bum. But that those four little notes kind of make that entire film. And, and the whole film's built around just those four notes and using that as communication. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, there's so many different kinds of chords that you can use, major, minor, six, uh, ninth, uh, suspended, you know, whatever. So many different feelings that you can get um, with just a simple melody, really. Yeah. Terrific. Well, uh, we need to say thank you and all of our students, if they could uh, unmute and say thanks also, because this film camp is part being made possible because of Klamath Folk Alliance sponsoring this. So uh, every everyone uh, needs to say thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, Curtis, for um, helping to make this thing a reality to teach all of us about filmmaking. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie and Curtis. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you well. I'm being... sorry I thank couldn't you. get on but at least the phone worked. <laughs> so that, that, that was great. Thank you very, very much for the insight. Um, hopefully uh, people understand that filmmaking is multiple sensory. It's not just yeah. the visual on screen, but there's other aspects to it to present the, the full picture. It's taking all those elements together. Um, and if you can find the right balance of those, then you have something special. Did you all discuss like soundtracks and sound effects in Foley this week? We very, very briefly touched on it just as part as part of elements to bring in, and they do have access to a sound effects library through Motion Array if they want some. Um, but we've been more focused on the visual side of, of teaching. But we wanted to have you two come in just to talk about how important audio is in the overall experience. Yeah, and that's not even getting into recording audio out in the field. I guess I guess you've all been doing that, so. Okay, um, I've got construction going on here, so I'm gonna sign off so things are not coming yep. through on here. Yeah, so th thank you for the time, Curtis, and thank you, Bonnie, for, for checking in. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, right. Andrew, I'm, I'm gonna make you presenter. Uh, okay. so that 
we can run through talking a little bit about festivals and distribution sure. of films. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna end up just sharing. I had a I had a whole presentation on this and I could not find it for the life of me today. And that fits with our theme for the day. So. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up some links and I'm going to share my browser and um, I will post these links in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to talk a little bit about distribution. You know, you have you're going to be finishing up a short film and then you all have to decide what you're going to do with it. Um, and even if you decide, you know what, this this was a great learning experience, but I, I don't want to do anything with this short film yet. That's fine, too. But hopefully you've gotten the bug and you're going to make more films and at some point you're going to want people to see them and uh, for short films for the most part there are basically two places to distribute your films those are online um, putting your your short films on um, sites like youtube or vimeo uh, or sending them to film festivals and those two aren't mutually exclusive although a lot of the higher end film festivals um, don't want your work to be online at the same time. And so oftentimes uh, what people will do is create maybe a private link that they can share with family and friends and the people who worked on the film with them. Uh, but otherwise they keep it offline, maybe put a trailer or something like that, but keep it offline and send it to film festivals first, get a little bit of a festival run and then they release it onto um, YouTube. So I wanna show you um, some sort of how festivals work. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you a link to a uh, website, Film Freeway, and this is actually how you would submit to the Klamath Film Festival, mm -hmm. if you ever want to submit there. And when you go to Film Freeway, um, Film, Film Freeway is a great site. Uh, you can create a um, free project. And so if you add a, um, a, you know, add a you start you free, create a free account and you can add as many projects as you want, and so it costs you nothing. I'll come up with a form like this, and you just put all the information about your film. It asks you for all these sort of contact info. Uh, if you have any like social media pages, what kind of project? So you can also submit scripts, for instance. If you have a great short script but you haven't made it yet, there's a lot of screenplay competitions out there. Um, and there are also things for even some music, uh, speaking of music, there's some music contests out there as well. Um, I have opportunities to sort of specify what kind of project, what genre, that kind of stuff, your runtime, uh, when it was completed. Uh, sometimes you can put budget in there if you want to, all kinds of those technical details. Um, you can put any awards that you've gotten uh, in there and then you save project. And I'm going to go to um, the dashboard. This is an account I created for uh, a class where I was submitting some things for students. In fact, um, most of these were films that were submitted to the Klamath Independent Film Festival. And you see out, out of the five that we submitted, two got in and uh, three did not. And then this was another class project where we had a uh, a single film that we submitted to multiple film festivals as a as a class uh, strategy. Uh, sorry, the, the, this is we're going over film festivals and how to submit to film festivals, Clem. So the link I just shared is filmfreeway.com, which is a platform for submitting films to film festivals. The nice thing about Film Freeway, uh, I actually recommend it to you whether or not you're immediately going to be uh, submitting to film festivals anyway, because again, it's free to create this project page and you can put it behind a password. And it's um, that way, even if you're not submitting to festivals, you have a place where you can give anyone access to your film, but control it where it's not just sort of out there on YouTube, but a place where you can sort of share it with friends for feedback and all that kind of thing. So it's a great uh, site to have your projects on. So I now actually require in our digital cinema program for all of our production classes, I require my students to deliver through Film Freeway. They have to create a project page in Film Freeway. They have to fill out all the details and they have to um, give me the, um, the password link. So this is this is a really old one, obviously from 2016. Um, it has the video. We, we don't actually have a poster image or any of that, but you, you can and should put in that kind of information. So you can create a poster, you can add a trailer, you can put behind the scenes still photos. You can uh, put in all the credits of the people who worked on it, uh, even like a director bio and, a, and a, um, a director headshot, all that kind of stuff. You can see all the 
um, spec specifications here. And that's what the festival sees when you submit. So when you create this free um, account with Film, Fest, uh, with Film Freeway, you now are set up to um, browse and submit to festivals. Now, not every film festival in the world is on Film Freeway. Um, there are still, especially some of the higher end festivals um, like uh, Sundance and those will often still have their own um, um, personal, you know, private um, submission platform. And so you might have to submit separately to some of the bigger film festivals. But um, there are thousands of film festivals on Film Freeway. I would say the vast majority of film festivals, even a lot of the bigger film festivals are on here. And you can search in all different kinds of ways. So, um, for instance, if you say, well, I've, I've made a, a student short and uh, I only want to spend, I don't want to spend more than $20 on an entry fee. Um, and I only, uh, and I only want to submit to film festivals that have been around for at least five years. I, you know, actually, it's actually pretty common for festivals to um, pop up and then disappear um, within a couple of years. Most film festivals don't last because uh, people, so many people think they can run a film festival and it's actually a lot of hard work as Kirk can talk about. And so you might want to say, well, I, I want to get a reputable film festival that I know will be around. Um, and then, you know, if you are trying to do a particular runtime, but as a short, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and you can also say specific um, deadline periods. And then um, by searching uh, those, you can also um, click the order in which they show up. So this is under the next deadline. So these are all the films with deadline uh, festivals with deadlines coming up soon. So you say, oh, well, Portland Film Festival, that's a festival I could actually go to. I could, my family could go up to Portland and, and see my uh, film in a film festival. So let's, let's look at it. So if we go now, I can go directly and submit if I want to. So I can pick one of these films and actually submit them. Or I can go to view festival and learn more about it. There'll usually be pictures up here of the festival event. Um, you can find out you know, kind of where it's at, what awards they they have. And so one, one great thing here is that you can decide, I'm only going to submit to festivals that have cash prizes, for instance. And you can search and, and check out what kinds of awards and prizes that festivals have. You can see the reviews. So, you know, how are people rating this festival? Is it a good festival? Do people have a good experience there? Um, and uh, and that's sort of how you use Film Freeway. And um, but sometimes you know you might want a little more some more tips on sort of how to find festivals. Uh, Movie Maker comes out with two lists every year that I recommend everyone look to, and I will um, paste those in the chat as well. One is uh, Movie Maker magazine does a 50 film festivals worth the entry fee every year. And um, they go through a process of rating film festivals and reviewing them and seeing sort of what's the payoff for filmmakers. Is it a really good filmmaker friendly festival? Is it a great experience? Um, do audiences really come out to, get, uh, to attend these festivals? And there's also um, the 25 coolest film festivals. And those are often festivals that are just a, a little funky, offer something a little different and unique um, that aren't um, always available at other festivals. And so I always encourage my students when they're thinking about submitting their films to film festivals to check out the latest list from Movie Maker on both of those to see what festivals they might be interested in. There's also um, this list, which is sort of the, the top, and these are the top tier festivals, um, both nationally and internationally on Studio Binder. Um, again, these are your, your big time film festivals. Um, these are festivals where uh, a lot of stars are at. You know, films like to premiere, big feature films like to premiere there. Um, they often have distributors involved in them. Um, so, you know, you probably will not be submitting your films uh, from this week to these festivals. But if you stick with this and you keep making short films and developing your craft and you finally make something that you're really proud of, um, you might decide to build a festival strategy around hoping to get into one of these top tier uh, festivals. So these are some of the top tiers. And then um, I recommend this article here in which a, a film researcher named Stephen F Follows, he's a British guy, um, did a massive survey of um, festival directors and asking, what are you really looking for in films? 
Um, what are some of your pet peeves about filmmakers? Those kinds of things. And there's some really candid comments in here. And um, you know, your great insights as a filmmaker when you're setting out to make a short film. What are the things I should avoid? What are the filmmakers? Uh, what are the things that? Um, what are the, the, the cliches? The things that are going to keep my film from getting programmed? Once I submit, how do I behave? Um, if I if I want to hear from a film festival and I haven't heard, you know, what's the best way to reach out to them and and be polite and all that kind of stuff? What do I do when I get once I get there? And so um, this article has a lot of just really great behind the scenes um, comments about the entire selection process. It's really interesting because you know filmmakers, all we know is whether we got in or we didn't get in, and you know, when you don't get in, it feels bad. And you're and and if you ever submit to film festivals, you will get rejected by something. I I don't I don't know anyone who's ever submitted and gotten into every festival that they submitted to. Um, you're going to get rejected, and it's going to hurt. But what you don't know is um, the process behind it. And so often, a festival might be um, considering your film alongside multiple other films that are very similar. Um, and you know, we talked about length, for instance. So maybe they loved your film, uh, but they loved two other films that were equal length together as your film. So let's say you made a 10 minute film, they had two five minute films and they only had a 10 minute slot and they loved all three equally, well, they're probably gonna go for the two five minutes because now they can help two filmmakers out instead of one. Um, or um, you know, they have a two films that are very similar um, but one is just a little more polished or, you know, one had a star that was recognizable, um, that kind of thing. And so it doesn't mean that your film was bad. It doesn't mean people didn't like your film. It just means so many different things go into the fact, uh, the decision process. Um, uh, I am a programmer with the Ashland Independent Film Festival and uh, I've been doing that for several years. And I can tell you there's certain kinds of films that we rarely program at Ashland because we know our audience really well. And so for instance, rarely will a horror film get programmed at Ashland. We, it doesn't mean you can't submit, you're, you're allowed to submit, we don't forbid horror films, but it's unlikely to submit, is it's unlikely that a horror film is gonna get accepted. And so you have, when you're submitting to film festivals, you should do that research. You know, you should look at their website and look at last year's program. Um, find out what kinds of films they tend to program. Uh, because if I were you and you made a horror film, I would just tell you, don't even bother um, you know, the locals only is one of the exceptions. Um, we do program a lot of um, local ho horror films, but if you're not local, otherwise, you know, it's not even worth submitting to. Go find another film festival. In fact, the Valley, our region has uh, a couple of good horror-centric festivals. And so look for those kinds of things. Um, and just know, don't get discouraged, because there's always going to be these factors that you can't think about, um, and that's, you know, stuff you can't control. Make the best film you can. Um, do your research, make sure you're submitting to festivals that are looking for your kind of content, uh, but don't get discouraged when you don't get in because, um, you know, for, I'll give you a, a funny example. I'm, I, I don't have any films right now, but I have a, I have a script that I've been submitting to contests and um, I have a friend who's also submitting to contests at the same time. And we just had um, reverse situations where um, I won an award at one competition where she didn't even get in, and then another festival um, I didn't even get in, wasn't even considered, and she won the award. And we both submitted to both. And so again, there's there's so much different subjectivity that goes in here. You never know what the tastes are of the judges. Um, but the great thing about festivals is that you get your your films in front of people who otherwise would never see them. You get an opportunity if you can attend. You get to do Q and A's and talk to your audience. You get to meet other filmmakers. That's a really great experience is going to a film festival, a meeting with other filmmakers and sharing your, your stories with one another. And um, maybe you'll end up working together or, or helping each other out on a film. Usually there's things like panels and workshops at festivals. Again, a lot of them have prizes. And once you build a relationship with a festival, um, oftentimes you can keep sending your work to that same festival and you'll keep getting in and um and that just sort of helps your career and helps you make connections and network and so um, those are some of the reasons why i think it's a really good idea to submit to film festivals when you have a project you think is festival worthy uh, when you don't have a project you think is festival worthy youtube is a better um, option for you because um, you can still get it get people to watch it give you feedback 
Um, now, keep in mind the comment section on YouTube is a horror show in, its, in and of itself, right? You're going to get people who are cruel and say awful things about your work if you if you open up the comments. So that can be a downside. Um, but you can also still be discovered by other filmmakers. Um, there are actually people, YouTubers, getting um, you know development deals and things like that. So um, YouTube is a great free way of getting your work out there. But of course, um, there is still a lot of competition on YouTube and uh, certainly no, no guarantee that you're gonna get a lot more views on YouTube than you would at a film festival. But those are some of the reasons why you might consider one or the other. So any questions about any of that? I, I saw Roland laughing in the background because uh, his, film, his film this year that he submitted to, to KIF that we did accept is a horror film. <laughs> I am so glad that you mentioned not to submit to Ash and Independent Film Festival because I love that festival so much, but now I'm not, not going to spend the $30 or whatever whatever it is. So. Yeah, Thank I mean, you. you know, I've, I've seen a few. I mean, we there's always the exceptions, right? I mean, there's certainly always exceptions, and I have seen a few great um, horror films at Ashland, but, you know, we just know that the, the broader Ashland Independent Film Festival audience is not a big horror audience, and so, you know, they tend to sort of trend towards that older audience that really likes you know one i mean the fact the festival is open to everything uh, pretty much except for music videos that's one thing they'd never let in um but uh you know it, it trends towards documentary it always programs a lot more docs than than um, narratives and um tends towards those real social interest types of stories so that's true obviously in the documentary but also in the narratives i think it tends to um, the Ashland audience is one that's very um, engaged in social issues and political issues and those kinds of things. So the, we know that those are going to be the things that people buy tickets to. Um, there's a much there's a much smaller audience for more of the traditional comedy or traditional horror film, those kinds of things. So you know, one or two of those will get in, but you know, it's they're they're definitely a harder sell for sure. It's a very good point. I think it's also a good point just to mention, like you said do your research don't submit to a film festival just because it's got a great reputation i mean sure that's wonderful but read the you know go to film freeway and read the whole uh, paragraphs what it's about you know exactly. it's totally worth it give yourself money exactly and the other thing too that's one, one great thing about getting into a festival too and meeting the other filmmakers all right now you have a group of people who also got accepted by the same film festival ask them where are they submitting like where else have they had luck you know that so because you're probably hitting something of a of a similar vibe there people who have who are, who are reaching out to a similar audience so it's a great way to get recommendations um, of, of other festivals that are worth checking out regarding uh klamath independent film festival specifically i can talk to how we go about picking our films and and that might be of interest to folks um, this year is a little bit of an anomaly just because uh, you know, COVID is thrown a lot of film festivals. They've been forced to cancel or go online. Right now, our plan is that our festival is going to be both in person and online. Uh, that creates some issues with a few films where maybe they have a, a contract in place with a distributor that says that their films can't be streaming because maybe they're working on a DVD slash Blu-ray release. And so there's some films that we may only be able to show at the theater and not show on online. But how we go about our process is the way that we try to sell Klamath Independent Film Festival is that it is it is the made in Oregon film festival. We exclusively take films that are made in Oregon or made by Oregon filmmakers. We also accept stuff from Modoc and Siskiyou County just because they're so close on on the other side of the border. But basically, all all of our selection are made in Oregon films. So how can we kind of brand that and how can we cater that to our, our audience? Well, we've found in past years that the super artsy abstract films don't really work with our audience. They just fly over people's heads. So even though some of our judges may like some of those, at the end of the day, we end up cutting a lot of those and instead going towards more of the films that tell a story or documentaries or just have high entertainment value. Um, the way that we picked our festival this year, now our submissions were down this year, and I think that's because of COVID, where people had their uh, film productions shut down because they couldn't get everyone together to, to finish projects and whatnot. We got around 85 films submitted this year. Normally we get about 100 to 120 films. But uh, once we set the deadline that everyone was done submitting, we then formed a panel of initial judges that went through and watched every single film, all 85 of them. And we told them to 
uh, rate each film on a one to 10 scale under three categories, entertainment value, technical value, so like quality cinematography, good sound, stuff like that, and artistic value. And then I took in all of those scores, averaged out everything across all of the, of the judges, and anything that scored the lowest, we instantly cut from the fe from festival's uh, consideration. From that initial cut, we still had about 50 films, 50 to, to 60 films to look at. And we had an entire second panel of judges. Again, I'd say, I think it was seven or eight judges that then watched all of those films that, that were still in, in the running. And then at the end of everyone watching that, we had about a five to six hour long um, Zoom style meeting where we discussed every single film that we watched and we talked about the merits of it. We looked at the overall score ratings and said, uh, okay, you know, this based on its scoring might fit in, but is our audience really gonna like the, this film or, or not? And there were a couple that actually scored enough to make it in that we ended up cutting because we felt like it it didn't fit with the the, the vibe of Climate Independent Film Festival. There were one or two that didn't quite make the score that we then moved into that place. There were several that we looked at because of their length and thought, well, our festival only runs for three days. So we have very finite time on screen because it's not just screen time, but there's also Q and A's that we want to do with our filmmakers afterwards where they can in interact with the audience. We want to present some social events, pre-event, post-events. We want to make sure we have a break for lunch and dinner, stuff like that. We need to throw in an awards ceremony. So there's only so much time of actual screen time of showing films that you can get. So we looked at some and said, you know, this is a really good film, but it's half an hour long. We could fit maybe three or four films into that same time frame and give this one, this one, and this one some same justification. So by the time we got to that second panel of our programmers, we really had some difficult choices to make because at that point we got rid of the films that just weren't, weren't very good in that initial sweep. We had to cut some films that we really loved, but uh, we just, there wasn't space for them. That's not to say that, that I emailed every single filmmaker and said, this isn't a knock on your film at all. That This isn't uh, anything negative. It just, for this year and for our program, it, it just did not fit. And we certainly hope that you submit again. Um, we made cuts down to 36 films this year. So we have 30 short films and we have six feature length films. And Rollins film is one of the six feature films that made it into the film festival. And what we liked about his film is it, that it combined comedy with horror elements. So it, it, it takes more of kind of the evil dead approach to, to horror. It, it is a horror film. It's a film about serial killers, but it's a fun, engaging, weird, quirky film about serial killers. Uh, Ron, maybe you want to describe your film. I actually have your trailer queued up, but there's not going to be any sound for it. So, <laughs> so maybe I, I can show that, and then you can just kind of describe what, what, what your film is and, and what's it about. Like while the trailer's happening? Yeah. <laughs> Director's commentary, live. Let's do it. <laughs> Imagine some really cool music happening right now. It's like the best music you've ever heard. Um, <laughs> No, what the film is about is about these two uh, serial killer brothers who go away to their cabin. Actually, this cabin you see behind me is the one you see in the trailer. <laughs> um, in uh, Bend, Oregon, and uh, they find a squatter in their house who also happens to be a serial killer. And they sort of bond over their shared body count. And it's a very loving story, I'd say, for nostalgia and family. And um, as you can see, a lot, of, a lot of murder spree happening. There's a lot of blood. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had a lot of fun making it up here last September. There's a cow. Uh, um, it was a great fun. And uh, there you see for a brief second, Mark Patton, star of Nightmare on Elm Street 2, who we were very happy to get for two days. And he was a wonderful man. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. I, I think it's an, if you're looking for a, an hour and a half of uh, oral comedy entertainment, I think that's the movie for you. And apparently the Klamath Independent Film Festival liked that very much. I'm very happy to be selected for, for six features uh, for Intel. So they, there's a lot of different factors that go into picking a film for a festival. Uh, and we do use Film Freeway, the site that, that Andrew was, was um, showcasing a little while ago uh, for all of our submissions. And then from there, we go through a very exhaustive process. And even after we've done that programming level to pick our final films, 
we had a whole additional panel beyond that of people from the film industry uh, who were our awards judges. And so they watched all of our 36 films. Again, they sent me their scores based on artistic value, technical achievement, and entertainment value. I averaged out all of those scores, and that determined our final awards. I'm not going to say who won what. Uh, you're you're going to have, to have to come out on Sunday uh, to, <laughs> to see. But um, we, we went through, we had a Hollywood actor, we had a film director, and we had a, a Maple Leaf Studio Film producer as our three awards judges. And based on all of their scores, I then averaged everything out, and we determined who our five category winners are. So we have K through 12 student films, we have Northern Features, which is what Rollins Kent film falls under, Southern Features, Northern Shorts, and Southern Shorts. And the, the criteria between a, a feature length film and a short film. The standard for most film festivals is 40 minutes. So a film that's more than 40 minutes is a feature. A film under that is considered a short. Uh, films that start to get up there, we classify as a long short. I know that's that's a, an, odd, an odd term. It's an oxymoron, but a longer <laughs> short between into 20 or 30 minutes in, in length. So once we have all of those films picked, the next thing that I have to do is figure out a schedule try to see how many of these films I can cram in. And it's not just a matter of, okay, I can shoo in all of these films and then have a Q and A, but also how do the films flow together? Cause just like how you don't want to have music clashing with the visual, you don't want to have one super happy film and then go into a film about um, uh, someone going through PTSD from being raped. You know, it, it's, it's, it's oh, too much of a roller coaster ride of, of emotion going from super happy to super sad or, or, you know, you want the films to kind of somehow cohesively fit. So it's like making a mixtape in a way of taking all these different films and seeing how they can all kind of interweave and connect in the best way possible and also fit the most stuff in within the, the time allotment. We're really crammed because we only do three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, September 18th through the 20th this year. So there's a lot of planning that goes into picking films. And it may be that a film that we picked for our festival that we really love doesn't fit with uh, another festival. Maybe it's a scheduling reason. Maybe they didn't have enough time. Maybe their programmers didn't like it. So just because one place gets rejected doesn't mean that it's not going to get picked, picked elsewhere. It, may, it just may not fit with the overall theme for, for our festival. We have found that just films that are super abstract and artsy just go over the head of our audience. So those films, even though some were visually stunning, um, we sat through that long lengthy meeting talking about each one. We're like, you know, it's a good film. We like it. But we just don't think that our audience is, is, is going to understand this. And do we want people walking out when they might really like the next film? So all of those things are, are criteria that go into thinking about um, film festivals and, and how, how they function. But film festivals also work incredibly well for networking. We have had multiple feature-length films shot here in Klamath Falls because of our film festival, where a filmmaker came here, met a producer, they started talking just in between films and ended up pitching an idea. And a year later, they're here in Klamath Falls filming the project that they, all these people met because they came to Klamath Independent Film Festival. And that sort of thing happens all over the country. People bring films that they've shot and they sign distribution deals where they'll get picked up by maybe Searchlight Pictures, uh, does that a, a, a lot. It's a distributary for Fox. Um, where they'll find a really great film that has no affiliation and they'll uh, they'll sign them to a contract to put that film in theaters and put it out on DVD. Or producers will come to a film fest with money to spend and wanting to latch onto a project that they really love and they meet a filmmaker that they saw something that they made and really liked and so they start talking to them and, and being like, hey, do you have any other ideas for films? And, and within a year or two, they're making a movie. So uh, it's not just, uh, film festivals aren't just there to show a film. I mean, that's the theme, but there's a lot of things that come out of a film festival as, as well. Do you want to talk maybe, Roland, about your experience with film festivals and kind of how it's helped out your career? Uh, sure. Um, well, first off, let me just point out that I have been rejected many, many, many times. And yeah, you do have to have a tough skin for it. But you will get used to it. You know, you will get used to the letter that pops up in your email saying, well, we've selected our movies and unfortunately there's just not enough room for your film. And that's their nice way of saying when you're not going to show your movie. Um, 
but I've been to a couple of film festivals, um, mostly with short films that I really, I really enjoyed, especially since uh, I get to travel to places I always wanted to see. There is a film festival near Las Vegas, I think it's in Boulder, Boulder City called the Damn Short Film Festival, D-A-M. And it was a wonderful screen, uh, three days of nothing but short films, but they were all high quality and I met some wonderful people there. And I completely agree with Kurt here that the, at least for me, the best thing about going to these film festivals is meeting other directors and producers and making connections because that's how I think you thrive as in this business is by making connections and it's about who you know. And occasionally you'll meet, meet someone with a like mind like yours and you'll say, want to make a movie? And they go, yeah, let's do it. You know, and, and you will. Um, but uh, yeah, film festivals, it's, it's really hit and miss sometimes. You have to decide, is this film worth it saying the money into these festivals too? Is this my best work? Because um, if it's not, uh, like Andrew said, YouTube might be the better place for it to go uh, than film festivals. It all depends on what you think of it. And I don't think it hurts to do a test screening too before you send to film festivals. Get a group of your friends who you really trust together, who you respect as filmmakers and get them together in a small, small screen room and say, what do you think? Is this worth saying this out into the world? Um, yeah, that's about all I can, I've been doing this for about five years and that's what I've come away with so far. I hope I hope to learn a lot, lot more though. You know? So we, we want to touch on, on people's films, and I know we're having audio issues, and I apologize for that, so we're not going to get the full experience. But before we, we delve into looking at the films that our students have uh, created here, does anyone have any questions so far or anything that they want to ask Roland before we, uh, we start looking at, at everything that you've created this week? Don't everyone speak at once. <laughs> well, uh, Roland, I, I appreciate you joining us so that uh, we can take a look at, at some of uh, what uh, our students have been working on. It's been a very whirlwind week for them as far as uh, uh, information we've thrown, thrown their way, try to inundate them with lighting and cinematography and how to write a script and planning out your shots and editing and all of those various elements all kind of thrown in within just a, a couple of days. But um, we're super excited. I have not seen any of these projects. People are just now dropping them into a, a Google Drive. But we can at least look at the visuals of well, Kurt, it if our, our audio isn't working. Yeah. Would it, would it be possible for us, you know, what we could do is, is um, post a direct link one at a time and then just tell everyone to mute and go watch the movie and come back and we can talk about it? Would that that work? might be poss possible. Everyone has that Google Drive link, well, except Roland, but I can e email that to you re real quick. Um, we have three films that have been uploaded. One of them, though, um, Unfair Ad Adventure. Um, Clem, for some reason, it's coming in in a file format uh, that isn't playing for me. But uh, the, the other two is a .mov file I'm, I'm able to see. I'm, I'm not sure if maybe you just need to uh, try rendering it again, either as a .mov or .mp4 file, um, depending on which which video program you're you're using. What are you doing? iMovie or Movie Maker or what? What are you using, Clem? Clem, no. well, maybe maybe he stepped away for for a second. Um, I mean, it said in the file type, it says .mp4, but then it has like yeah. dot and then like gibberish. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it was just an upload yeah. error. Yeah, I mean, that, that is possible. Um, Clem, if you can hear me, you may just want to try to re-uploading that same file. Uh, so we can, uh, I'm, I'm not sure the, the links here. Um, I'm looking at uh, the friend movie right now, which is Nolan's film. Oh, yeah, the other one's still processing. Okay. So friend, friend looks that, like the only one we can actually watch. Okay. Uh, so it's a three three minutes and 22 seconds is what, what I see. Um, 
I can hear it on, on my end, but I know we're planning on not hearing things. So this is uh, Nolan's film. Uh, Nolan, do you want to talk about uh, um, your experience in filming and editing and how maybe your story evolved from when you first wrote a script uh, into what you have now to present? Uh, yeah, um, filming was just really fun. Like some of it was just kind of me and my friends starting to mess around. But, um, you know, we were kind of limited, so I didn't get to do everything that I kind of like in first envisioned with it. But I think it turned out like, you know, it's beginner stuff, but it's it's OK. <laughs> but it was it was really fun to do. How did the uh, how did the story that you were telling with friends uh, change from when we first met on Monday and talked about script writing and storytelling into what you ended up filming? What was there, there anything you went back and revised? Um, we didn't, uh, so like on Tuesday night, I think, or no, yeah, it was like Tuesday night, um, right before, uh, I talked to my friends again and then we like came up with this completely newer idea and then wrote the script for that. And then, um, you know, we started, we started filming and then, um, we kind of had to shorten it down a little bit and then um kind of the visual stuff didn't come through as much because uh you know we were kind of limited but i think it kind of got across what i was trying to do good good um was there any like challenges that you hit during the course of filming or, or editing anything that you struggled with or uh editing because i was kind of new to it and then it was, um, I didn't really do anything, you know, it's, it's like a rough draft thing. So I didn't do anything too crazy. I just kind of put all the clips together and then tried to make the audio kind of blend together better. Were you using iMovie or Movie Maker or OpenShot or what? Um, I was going to use DaVinci Resolve. And then there was um, last night, um, the computer I was going to use on that, I, was, I didn't have access to. So I ended up having to use iMovie. And then, but I will probably go back and redo it on that. Okay, great. Well, you know, the, the one thing about iMovie, since I, that was the one that I demonstrated yesterday, is that it's perfect for beginners to learn the initial theory of how to, how to cut things together and, and how to splice shots. And then as you get more comfortable with that, then you can work your way up into the more intermediate and then into some more advanced stuff. DaVinci is, is a great step up. iMovie and Final Cut blend seamlessly. Everything that you do in iMovie is basically transitions into Final Cut, but it's got so many more buzzers and whistles that you can work with. Uh, Roland, do you use Premiere? Or do you use Final Cut or DaVinci or what? Premiere. Okay. So yeah, uh, Adobe Premiere and Final Cut are two very similar programs. They have some different nuances, but essentially if you can use one, you can basically use use the, the other the, the process is essentially the same it's just some do things a little bit different than, than the other so so um we have a three minute long film and um i can try to show it in in the window uh and we can either narrate or since everyone has the google drive link except for all and i can email that to you right now um we can all take like a three and a half minute break Try to open up that video, watch it, and then come back and talk about it. Um, do people have a preference? Works for me. That's okay, cool. Bear with me. Can just I just ask quickly, did mine not show up? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I saw your message on that. We have the first date and friend. So we have Nick's and Nolan's films in, in the shared drive. The An Unfair Adventure. Uploaded, but it uploaded in a really weird format, Clem. So we're we're uh, going to need you to e either try re-uploading that, or maybe try re-rendering your video from your your video editing software, and then upload it from there. Okay. Sorry, we're we're filled with all sorts of technical problems today. Um, so, Roland, I'm sending you an email right now. Okay. And if everyone else wants to go into that Google Drive, and let's take a look at Friend first. So everyone download Friend, Nolan's film. And it's a three minute, 22 second film.
And okay, Roland, I just sent you the link. Copy that. Okay, is everyone uh, done with the film? Yes. Okay, Nolan, congratulations on uh, on making Friend. Um, I there's a lot to like about this. First of all, did you shoot this with your phone or did you use a camera? Uh, yeah, I used my phone. Okay, I really love the fact that your film had a lot of movement to it. 
there were, there were, even though using your phone, um, it felt like you were being immersed in, in the film with the constant movement. You had some good, over, you had a nice over the shoulder shot, you had some wide shots, you tracked people very well in, in the, the course of the movement. So that's what really stood out to me initially was um, be, beyond the, the story, which I think you did a really good job on, of just being able to immerse the viewer in the experience by having a lot of camera movement and kind of tracking the, the, the action. Um, Andrew Rollin, what, what did you think of the Nolan's film? Well, yeah, I, I agree. I thought the the movement was, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of sort of cinematic thinking um, throughout the throughout the film. Um, I think, you know, I, I know this. Obviously, I I work uh, with a lot of um, beginning filmmakers, you know, freshman college students who have never touched a camera before, um, and oftentimes they're they're sort of afraid to move the camera. You know, it's a lot of this sort of static storytelling, and um, you you really went for it, and and for the most part, it was real stable and um, didn't make me you know nauseous or any of the kinds of things that can sometimes happen with someone who's inexperienced um, so real nice camera movement I thought overall the shot compositions were pretty nice um, throughout the piece it felt um, you know everything was um, clear and focus uh, well staged um, so I thought it was uh, all of that was really good I did notice it was just one little uh, thing for, to, for you to fix before you get to your uh, final cut. Let's see if I can get the exact seconds. It's like at the 40, I think 47 seconds in, you have a black frame um, that appears between two shots. Uh, it looks like you just accidentally missed a, like when moving around your footage somehow left in a little, little bit of space. Um, so make sure you find that around 40 seconds, 47 seconds uh, and fix that. But uh, otherwise, I thought this was a really great first effort. Yeah, uh, fantastic job, Nolan. This is definitely a film too that would really be accented well with a, a subtle background soundtrack. When it's the two friends out doing stuff, something that's very playful, upbeat, kind of happy, joyful. And then when you get to the medication part, kind of bring more of a somber or darker or, or a little more uh, disturbing tone in, into it would really accent the, the story that you're trying to convey. Roland, what, what did you think of the film? Uh, well, you two pretty much said the parts I really enjoyed, the camera movement. Um, I also really enjoyed the quick editing, uh, especially towards the end, which I think is very important when dealing with comedy situations. Uh, editing needs to usually be quicker back and forth. And I think the beginning, it was a slower edit, which I liked. And then as the dialogue got quicker and the comedy became more apparent, you edited uh, more rapidly, which I thought was a good choice. Yeah. Yeah, one, 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 there's one beat where I thought you could have lingered a little bit more, and that was the first, um, when we're riding in the car, and we and we pan on the guy's look, and we see the the character by himself, um, I kind of, because I actually missed it the first time, I, I had to watch it again to, to catch that he was alone, because it just happened a little fast. So I think if if you have a little bit more footage there, just let it linger like a one or two seconds longer to make sure your audience gets that. Oh no, because because it's a long shot, you know, it's easy to sort of miss a detail like that if it happens too quickly. Um, but I, I like how you make that reveal. It's a really great reveal to sort of bring us into someone else's perspective. And it's great again. Jumped in a car, made, kept it dynamic, something a little interesting. Uh, but just like make sure we get that beat. Oh, overall, fantastic job, Nolan. I'm I'm really impressed by this. Was this the very first time that you tried to film something? Uh, no. Me and my friends have done like kind of like the like funny skits before, but nothing kind of like this where we had to go around. Usually, it was just like in my house. Well, great use of locations. I mean, you you, you did something without having to go anywhere where you couldn't, you know, do you do the social distancing with people you haven't already been interacting with. Um, you know, you, you make good, good use of um, available locations without having to, you know, deal with businesses or anything like that. Uh, again, a lot, a lot of dynamics to it. A lot of movement, a lot of new locations, kept it, kept, kept it from getting boring. Yeah. Clem, I, I, I do see your message. Um, 
if you're having issues with rendering, I think that's probably something that you and I should maybe walk through uh, where we don't do it necessarily during this meeting, but maybe uh, uh, at the end, um, when everyone else drops out, um, I'll, I'll set up so that you can share your, your screen and I can kind of walk you through the process step-by-step step to make sure that we, we can get it rendered. Is, is that okay with you, Clem? Okay, he, he said yes. Okay, so just when when we end the meeting, um, just hang around and I'll work with you to get it rendered and, and we'll, we'll get a chance, chance to check it out, okay? Um, Roland, do, do you want to talk about the very first thing you ever filmed? <laughs> uh, sure. The very first thing I ever filmed was a short called One Week and it, all it was was I put my camera up and I didn't move it for five minutes while my girlfriend made strange faces and I would just cut like time frames in between like five bits. It was a great comedy, short comedy. It played at the Portland Near National Film Festival for some reason. Um, it was just, I honestly did it just to see if I could get into the festival. And I, and, and I did it and I'm glad it made a lot of people laugh and made people really appreciate that my girlfriend has a wonderful face that with big eyes that can do so much without talking. Yeah, it was that was basically the first thing I ever did. Yeah. The the first editing that I ever tried to do was I'm I'm self-taught as an editor. I grew up in Eugene, both my parents are University of Oregon alums. So I was going to duck football games and duck basketball games since I was in diapers. And so I started dabbling with putting together duck sports highlights just to sort of experiment with the software. And that's really where, where I kind of cut my teeth and, and learned. And I don't want anyone to ever see those early videos that I made because they're absolutely awful. But it was an opportunity to learn and try things out, go through trial and error to see what worked and what didn't. Uh, so uh, Nolan, this is a, a fantastic first, first effort for your first real film. Really kudos, great job. Um, Mary Jane or Clem or, or Jenny and Nick, do you have any, any comments for Nolan before we move on to the next one? Everyone's shy. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 for some reason, everyone's been super shy with, with our camp. Uh, I, I don't know why that is, but. Um, we, well, you know, let me throw this out to you and, and, um, and, and that's not to put any of you on the spot, you know, you can be shy today, but, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind, this is what I always tell my students too, because they're always, especially in our, those early classes where we're trying to get them to like give critique and give feedback and everyone's terrified of both hearing something mean about themselves, but also about saying anything mean about anyone else. And like, oh, I can't, I, you know, I, I can't critique it, you know, that's their work. Um, but we only get better by by um, through feedback, right? And so um, that that's the thing I really drill into my students is like, you know, you owe it to one another to give each other um, feedback, both on like identifying what really worked and and why uh, and why it worked, and also like what didn't work for you, and 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 no, just like ah, I don't like that, but like all right, so what would what what could be done to address that? Um, and that's and it's a real skill to learn how to do that, but um, it's it's actually a gift that you give people. So don't don't be afraid of telling someone, uh, you know, this this here that could have used a little work, uh, or or I didn't understand this. Um, that's that's okay. It's you're not being mean. You're not being a bully. You're you're actually sharing and and helping them develop their voice. Uh, since you move, since you used iMovie, Nolan, um, one suggestion that I have now a lot of your your camera movement is really fluid. For the most part, it's pretty smooth. But with those clips, you may want to use the camera stabilization tool if you didn't already, just to kind of smooth out some of those shots a, a little bit. That's um, that's one of the the built-in features in iMovie that you could just click to some of those shots and activate that. Let it let it do its thing and then you can adjust how much stabilization there is and that's just going to kind of smooth it out so it, um, some of those shots won't be quite as much of this it'll be like more kind of subtle like like this um, uh, other other than that re really good job um, so if no one else has any other comments should we move on to the uh, the next one which is the first date by uh, Jenny and Nick I made a movie called first day <laughs> so if every if everyone could download the first date.
and this one is three minutes and 44 seconds. Is everyone else still uh, watching it, or is it people done? Watched it. Yep. We're here. I'm good. good. Okay, great. Um, Jenny and Nick, congratulations on on making a fantastic film. It made me laugh, which is always always a the great first step. A couple of thoughts that I had uh, initially. Overall, really well shot, really well done. Um, the music that you use at the start really sets the tone well. Really great selection there. The one thing about it though is that when it ends, it ends really abruptly and it's a little jarring. So what I would do is either use the audio faders on the track itself, if I remember you said that you were using Final Cut, and just pull that left so that you get more of a subtle decline or alternately you could also drop a you can drop transitions onto audio tracks. So you could also just put a fade out transition onto the audio track itself and that way it wouldn't be so hard hitting. 
with the, the way that the music stops. So, so just drag that out a little bit and give it a couple seconds to just slowly kind of fade out and I, I'll make it a lot better transition coming in. Um, there were two some assistance with stuff like that because that was one of the things there were a couple sure. of glitches in it and the sound was really kind of I was trying to do the editing this is Jenny um, yeah. and I was really struggling with the sound and trying to figure out how to how to make it work so any tips on what to do I'd appreciate it. Sure. Now, it sounded like it was peaking to me too I don't know if that was just in my playback but uh, it sounded like the music was maybe um too high and was peaking a little bit that may have been because i was trying to figure out how to dim it and and it would just take the whole line down because i didn't know what i was doing um, there there's a there's a couple different things that you can do it in final cut um final cuts audio works the same way as in imovie where you can just simply click and drag on the audio file itself and drag it up or down and that will adjust the overall volume of the track in uh final cut in the upper right corner where you have your inspector tools one of the buttons is a little audio speaker and that will allow you to adjust your, your audio settings and there's just a scroll bar that you can pull that will also drop down um, uh, the, the, the decibel rating for the, the music um, but overall i really like the music that you picked i it has kind of a quirky upbeat vibe to it that really matches the, the tone you're trying to set so really good job on that i i just think kind of smoothing that out a little bit will add to the film the other thing that i noticed was there's there's two cuts one around 215 and another around 240 where it's a little bit jarring i'm not sure if you were intentionally trying to trying to get like a you know su super nervous so like a little mini panic attack no we have two... a couple of cut glitches in there and okay. we're trying to figure them out and address them we couldn't quite tell what was happening those but in both of those those cuts since they are also uh changes in and seen um, are perfectly fine spots to put transitions. So I would put either a cross dissolve or maybe a nice blur fade in there. And it's okay for it to run long because that's going to kind of you know smooth out the ride from going from you know bathroom to car or whatnot. So um, we did talk yesterday about not to use or not to use too many tr transitions that, that can kill a project. But I think both of those times are perfect times that you could throw in a nice smooth transition to, to really even out, out those shots. So overall, really, really good job. Really well done. Um, Andrew, Roland, what, what did you two think? Yeah, I thought um, very funny and and I saw the influence of uh, of This Is John. You could t definitely tell you were going for that. Oh, totally. Oh well, we, you know, we, had, we, had the, we had them watch the, the Mark Duplass uh, keynote and, oh. and This Is John. So I love that you went for that kind of tone um, and, and I thought it worked really well. Um, I did think that maybe you could trim the part in the bathroom a little bit and and it's and it's not a performance reason I think it is just because you kind of picked one angle and stuck there for a little bit and so it's a little static and so I might tighten up that middle portion of the bathroom a little bit um but otherwise I thought the performance is really funny um the opening sequence the music is really funny and I love the the final little button at the end of uh, coming out in the jammies and, and the, with the pizza box. Um, the only other thing that maybe I might recommend, uh, even if you want to do like a quick reshoot for an insert, is getting a slightly tighter um, shot of the text message. Uh, I think that might help a little bit because it's you know a little hard for my or it was a little hard for my eyes to to read the text message. Um, I, but otherwise, I, I I definitely thought it was really funny. What, one thing that you could do with that text message is uh, use a Ken Burns effect, like slow slow down the clip itself and and use the, the Ken Burns effect to kind of do a zoom in on it so that you give people more of a chance to read all of the text. Because I, I tried to read all of it, I'm a pretty fast reader, but I didn't get through all of, all of the text before it, I, it cut away. So let, let that sit for a couple seconds to give people a chance to fully absorb what, what the message is. It doesn't have to be a, a super quick cut. Um, one other thing too is that your music at, at the end, your credits go by super fast. You could slow that down, and I, I would recommend sl slowing that down. The music continues for another good 30 seconds after it's an all-black screen, and that's just a, an example of you putting in the music track and forgetting to cut it. So uh, whenever your credits are done, uh, I just use your blade tool, 
to cut off the music and again, you know, drag the fader over so that it, it'll do a slow fade out. And that way you don't have that extra 30 seconds or so of, of just black screen with music playing in the background. Nothing wrong with the, the music selection. It fits fine. Just there's no reason to have that run when you have nothing but a black screen on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a mistake on our part. We didn't uh, see that it was still going. So I've I've done that exact same mistake on many many videos where I don't realize it until after I've rendered it and go, oh crap. And so I have to go back, cut that, and then you know make sure everything lines up, and then re-render, and then then upload. It it happens to the best of us, so don't don't feel bad about that. But just something to be conscious of. Yeah, um... Roland, your thoughts. You know, I swear to God, Andrew's reading my mind because uh, what the exact the two things I had to were going to say was, oh, it's this is John, and the other note was the screenshot of of the text. Those are the two things I was going to add, but it's already been said, so <laughs> I honestly don't think I can add any more helpful input here. Um, but I do I do say I I do have to leg off now. I do I do got to go, okay. but thank you so much for having me and letting me watch your uh, your your short films. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Nice meeting you, Roland. Nice meeting you, Roland. Thank we'll you. see you at Klamath Independent Film Festival in a month. I'll see you there. Thanks, Roland. Thank okay, uh, Mary Jane or Clem or Nolan, do you have any thoughts about Ginny and Nick's film? Uh, overall, I will say that for the two films that, that we watched, great job, both of you. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, we, we threw a lot of stuff your, your way this week and not all of it was retained, but what, uh, what we did try to teach, I think it really came out in, in your films and, and hopefully made it, made it better. I hope it was a really fun experience for you and that it's, it's made you want to go out and, and do more. Obviously, there's still some tweaking to do with both of these projects. Um, Andrew, we should, um, I was thinking that this weekend we would announce a winner, but um, I think we should give some extra time because Joni and Hannah haven't had a chance to film yet. Yeah. And so we, we want to give them a few days to, to let them kind of do their projects. So maybe sometime next week, we'll, we'll set a firm deadline for everyone to, to wrap uh -huh. up all of, all of their, their edits. Um, well, yeah, I definitely want to commend, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the others, but um, definitely out of those first two, um, you know, you. The, these are already at the quality that um, my my starter students are doing in a in a in a eleven week course, and and you did it in one week. So um, I'm very impressed with what you all were able to pull together. So, do we have any uh, any sort of questions uh, with the process, or, or anything that after going through your initial shoots that you're not sure of, or or you want us to reiterate, or or things that uh, maybe you've learned from it, feel free to, to share any thoughts. Well, I would just say um, as, as a mom, <laughs> this has been a really great opportunity to, um, to work on a project in the middle of COVID with my teenager. Gross. Um, I know, I knew, <laughs> I knew he wasn't gonna like it, but you know, that's, that's my prerogative as a mom. Anyway, it was a fun project to get to work on. I loved getting um, to learn. I've, you know, I'm a beginning filmmaker myself and learning constantly. Um, and I've watched a lot of videos on YouTube and so forth to try and teach myself various aspects of this. Um, but it was really great to have this condensed version um, in this one week with a project to do and um, and to if we needed to have the ability to come back and ask questions. I really thought it was an amazing uh, workshop camp. Um, and I hope that you guys continue to do it because I think it's just a, it's a great opportunity to, um, to support local filmmakers and uh, young filmmakers in particular. Um, and Nick and I, I think he would say, we mostly had a good time except for when we got into a couple of little snarls with each other yeah <laughs> i'll try and be less gushy and long-winded but um <laughs> the the pieces that i did were uh mostly things that i had you know tried my hand at before in various ways i'm a writer and an actor before anything else kind of uh and i really struggled to write scripts especially when i was younger i mean 
I don't know a lot of 10 year olds who are cranking out really incredible scripts, um, but I have always had a problem with being too like wordy. So I would definitely have those kinds of text chunks, but actually having someone sit down with me and tell me how to write a script as opposed to just write a story um, was really helpful. And I was really thrilled that I was able to sit down and write a script in a day. Uh, it was pretty cool. And no, sorry. And um, I also haven't been able to do any like actual acting in like two years. So it was cool to have a opportunity to do that in a very low pressure environment, you know, my own bathroom. Um, yeah, so even though I haven't yet tried my hand at any newer skills, this gave me some opportunities for some stuff that I've been working on for a long time, but just haven't had the uh, venue for. Awesome. Right. Uh, one other thought that I just had uh, about your film as well is that uh, since your film does have music, you need to include the music title in your end credits. So uh, you, you need to include whatever the song title is and, and uh, if it lists the composer or whatnot, you also need to throw that in there into, into your final end credits. And slow, slow the credits down. It's okay for, for them to go slow. They don't have to go by at lightning fast speed. Those are just placeholder credits, but yes, thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, Mary Jane, it looked like you unmuted it. Is there something that you wanted to share about? Oh, I just wanted to thank you for the week. I thought it was, I learned a lot. I do not have a film or anything to share. Um, a little bit time challenge because um, we had a week, a long weekend planned out and um, I traveled yesterday. I'm um, on the coast right now, but oh, okay. I, I um, really appreciate um, all the information that was shared and find it valuable. And when I have time, um, I will put something together. I would not be able to do that if it weren't for this week. And I know I will need some help with the techie part, but um, it will happen. Thank you. Well, uh, Mary Jane, if, if we set a deadline of, say, maybe next weekend, would that be enough time for you to at least put together a rough cut? Possibly. Um, okay. I can try. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Well, everything we tried to teach you is still fresh in your mind. And go back and review the videos if you have any questions. You can still contact me if you have any problems. But we would love to see um, a project in any form from from you whether you feel it's finished or, or not just try try to put something together and we will wait for your film to come in before we make a final decision on our our winner regardless uh mary jane wins uh some special award here for punctuality because mary jane joined all of our meetings at least 15 minutes before things started every single time and it was pretty much as soon as i opened up the meetings within like 15 20 seconds mary jane had joined the meeting so uh yeah some 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 special acknowledgement there for for being early to class every single day <laughs> oh so funny you don't know how funny that is because um i'm usually the one that's late for everything <laughs> but for some reason this week just worked out really well <laughs> thank you right uh so Clem, I want to make sure that you hang around because I need to help you with rendering your project so that we can get your, your video up. Um, but uh, Nolan and Nick and Ginny, fantastic initial jobs. Um, really well done. That you, you both really impressed me for, for first time projects. That's way better than what I could have ever done with my first videos. I mean, it, it takes practice. It takes a lot of repetition to get good at this stuff. So don't be discouraged if something isn't exactly the way that you want it or, or you know, sometimes the technology that you're using might be limiting in, in some capacity. But as you keep dabbling and trying things, you're going to be able to add more to your repertoire, both as far as skills go and equipment, and, and really start to delve into more projects that, that you want to tell. Nick, I I'm really glad to hear that you enjoyed this and you being an actor, perhaps this week maybe showed you a little bit more of the other side of things that you can then apply to being an actor and better understand maybe where directors are coming from when, oh, sure. uh, 
when, when they're putting things together, right? Yeah. And I had a question. Um, I, I think I know the answer, but I just want to verify. Because we do have a couple of glitches and uh, and stuff there, is it possible to offline get a little help with some of those? Because yeah. I was trying to, like, with the glitch stuff that was shaky and everything, I kept trying to figure out what was wrong, and I couldn't figure out what was in the way there. It wasn't allowing me to just do what I know how to do, which is just yeah. a a blade or a or a move it with the cursor kind of thing it wasn't allowing that um it seems almost like there's something underneath it another layer but i couldn't figure it out so maybe i, I would yeah I, I would be happy to work with you on that if um uh, as you have the capacity to share screen we could either do a separate session where i can see uh your your edit and then um i can kind of walk you through some of the, the corrections to make or i can share my screen in final cut and pull up your video in it and go through some of the some of the different corrections that that i would make and then you can just kind of follow along and, and do it in your edit e either way is fine by me but i'm happy to work with you on on that to kind of uh, clean up the project a little bit great i'd appreciate that thank you okay and then clem you need to hang around and i'll try to walk you through rendering and if need be we can spend some a little bit more time on that uh, Andrew, any any final thoughts? Because this is our, our last official session. We're we're uh, Andrew and I will still get back in touch and we'll we'll review all of the films and pick our, our winner for for the week. So we'll still be talking, but this is kind of our our final goodbyes for the week. So thank you everyone for being a part of it. Yeah, thank you so much for all your hard work and for being a part of it. And uh, you know, if you have any any feedback or thoughts, you know, send them Kurt's way because we do hope to do this and again in the future and. Uh, anything we can do to make it a, a improved experience obviously hopefully we'll get to do it in person <laughs> with equipment uh but if not we'd love to keep doing it this way if we have to uh because i think i thought it was a pretty cool thing and um it sounds like jenny nick liked it too so uh would love to hear any other feedback you all have uh, via email and uh congratulations and maybe next year we can do it in person where we're all working on the same project or we're working on a couple different projects over the course of the week and all collaborating as well, not just everyone being off doing, doing their own thing. So, uh, but yeah, we, we definitely want to try to do this again and maybe make it an annual thing. Uh, maybe not so close to our film festival, <laughs> but uh, uh, because it, this has been a very stressful week for me with all of the film festival things I have to do and still teach all of this stuff. It's been a lot of very late nights, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that people found it a fruitful experience and hopefully we can learn from this and next year make it make it even better. All right. Thanks all. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Clem, hang, hang around and, and for everyone else, you are off to finish your projects. <laughs>